So our first speaker today is Natasha Kaplan. She got a PhD from the University of London, King's College Hospital Medical School. Then she did her postdoctoral training in England. And then in 1996, she came to the US and started working for the National Human Genome Research Institute. And at the NHGRI, she started working on siRNA. And then we were fortunate at NCI to recruit her in 2004 as a senior scientist. Now she's a tenure track investigator in the genetics branch, and she's going to talk about functional genomics. Natasha. Thank you, Gary. Green. Yeah, green. Green means go. Okay. So uh, as Terry says, the, the focus of what I'm talking about today is going to be functional genomics. Um, and what I'm going to do is give you a, just a very basic and very brief introduction, I hope, to different aspects of how, what I mean by uh, functional genomics and how we can manipulate gene expression. Then I'm going to go through some of the technological um, approaches to this, focusing on loss of function analysis, so gene silencing and gene editing. But I want to spend most of the time talking about actual applications, particularly in the screening-based um, analysis, because that's probably more outside of what most of you are actually able to do in your labs and give you a sense of where you can go and think bigger about this, but also think about some of uh, the issues have you have to take into account when you are doing screening-based analysis with any uh, methodology. All right, so why do we need functional genomics? It probably doesn't need to be said in this context of this, but I just want to make sure everyone's on, on the same page. So. You know, we can now do uh, analysis of DNA copy number sequencing. We can look at epigenetic modifications and gene expression on very, very high throughput levels. Um, but actually being able to then translate that into thinking about how genes actually function has remained a, a difficulty in a systematic manner. And so what really has been uh, what I've worked on for the last um, 15 years is trying to come up with ways where we can do this on a larger scale um, and speed up our thoughts about how genes are working and, and trans, uh, into a translational setting. So I have focused, and what I'm going to talk about today is predominantly going to be working cell lines using transformed cancer cell lines. And on the whole, that tends to be the majority of the work that's done on this campus. But I'm very aware that a lot of people are doing functional genomic analysis in lots of whole organisms from bacteria through mouse. Um, and some of the uh, methods I'm going to describe today are, uh, are just as applicable within whole organisms, um, though obviously in, in a different way. But I'm going to focus today on using transformed can cancer cell lines. Other groups uh, can, are using primary cells. Some of what I'm going to do is increasingly going to be applicable to primary cells and to things like iPS cells and to uh, PDX models, particularly CRISPR-based uh, technologies. So. For completeness, though this is rarely used these days, I'm going to talk about gain of function very briefly. So it was when I was a lowly, lowly student, really overexpression was actually the, the norm for trying to study gene expression. We would do effectively what it was a gain of function. We do it on a background where we could see now how do cells change because we're overexpressing it. It doesn't tend to be as clean a system for looking at gene function as loss of function, so it's lost some. Um, impetus, but it still has some relevance. And so I'm just putting it out there that there are circumstances where it's clearly applicable to overexpress the gene. But what most uh, labs focus on these days is doing loss of function. So you're removing a gene from a particular setting and then measuring or looking at a specific phenotype to see what is the normal expression of what is that uh, gene normally doing. And there are two broad approaches to this. You can do a knockdown, which is the focus predominantly of the work I've done for the last 10 years, or you can do a, a knockout. These can give you slightly different answers because it depends very much on the threshold effect of how much a, you need a protein. But they can have pros and cons to both of these. Uh, knockdowns can be uh, have the advantage of they're very reversible. So you can knock it down, and then you can allow it to come back and see what happens. Knockouts is irreversible in many contexts. And has, but it, if your gene is completely essential, that makes it very hard to, to look at it in terms of some aspects of its biology. Now, the other piece of, of sort of jargon I want to make sure everyone's on board with is forward versus reverse genetics. And these are terms that are actually less uh, used these days than they were when I was a student. I'm sort of trying to reintroduce them um, in teaching because they're actually quite important. Um, so the context of forward genetics was really the only way we were able to map 
gene function for a long time on, on any sort of scale, which was where you had no prior genetic information. You would just use a, a mutations, usually uh, induced by chemical, radiation, or viral mutagens, and see what phenotype gener uh, generated from that. What, you, what most of us are now performing is effectively reverse genetics, because we know what it is. The, we have the genetic information already. We're using the transcriptome. We're using um, genome-based information to generate the agents we have for a phenotype. Both can be unbiased. But because we're often doing this in the context of prior genetic information, this can lead to biases in terms of what people tend to choose to look at. And so that's something I just always bear in mind, that it, to be truly unbiased, you have to do these things on a whole genome scale, and you have to stay unbiased all the way through the process of studying it. And I'm going to come onto that when I start talking about screens. OK. So in that part, I'm now going to turn on to technologies, not exonally. Uh, to technologies, and I'm going to talk about these in two general different flavors, which is gene silencing, which is purely a knockdown, and then gene editing, which can come in two different flavors of knockdown and knockout. Now, obviously, this is a field that I came into when it was RNAi, and it was really the only uh, 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 game on the block for a long time. Uh, for a while, we started seeing talents come in, um, though they never really took off to totally replace RNAi in any ways. But now, obviously, a lot of things are now revolving around being able to do uh, CRISPR-Cas9 as an alternative to RNAi. I cannot, it is impossible in the time available, or it's not even really appropriate for me to go through all of the different ways that CRISPR-Cas9 systems are being currently used to study gene function. It's just impossible. So what I just want to do is make sure you're all familiar with what's available. And then I'm going to talk about uh, specific uh, screening uh, approaches using Cas9 to ask some questions about some, uh, a, can a couple of cancers uh, as sort of state of the art um, and what came from that and what you have to be careful about in that context. OK. So I'm going to start off by just going through a little bit through this table. So this is from a review in molecular cell from last year. And it's still really one of the best ways of looking at all of your different options that are available for doing functional genetic analysis. And so I would really urge you that if you're trying to think about an experiment that you want to do in this context, that you take a look at this, because it sort of walks everybody through the different options that are available. And I'm going to do the same today. And obviously, I can't go to the level of detail that's in this, in, in this review. And there's a lot of other reviews that have now sort of taken this as a, as a starting point, and you can build from this, this, this particular paper. So I'm going to start with RNAi. Um, so RNAi acts at a post-transcriptional level and is in triggering RNA degradation. This is therefore a reversible knockdown, so it's transient. Unless you uh, are using shRNAs, you have two different types of effector molecules or transgenes and guides. You have sRNAs. These are synthetic molecules. I'll describe these in a little more detail in a minute. And these are, are, are purely transient. shRNAs can be put into a plasmid vector and expressed stably. So this is a reverse um, genetics in that we, the only required information you need is the transcriptome sequence. The problem is, is that your off-target space in terms of, and I'll talk about this in terms of sequence alignments, is also the whole transcriptome. There are ways of addressing this, and this has got better and better over time, but it's something you need to be bet, bet borne in mind. What is nice about this system is that you can target all variants. So if you're very careful about how you design, the RNAi effectors, whether these are siRNAs, SIs, or shRNAs, you can take out all the variants of a particular transcript, or at least most of them. Or you can take out single variants, depending on how you design um, the, the reagents. So what, does, what is RNAi? I'm going to assume that most people here in this room or even online are aware of the basics of RNAi. But just in case, it, this is a gene silencing mechanism that is not there just to be convenient to scientists. It's there to regulate gene expression predominantly through uh, the microRNA pathway, though there are other natural mediators, uh, including chi RNAs, for example. These are microRNAs are found as pole 2 uh, expressed transcripts, um, as any other genes. But these are then processed quite rapidly through a whole series of proteins. And I'm not going to go into this. This isn't a microRNA talk. But they go through their process and expressed in the cytoplasm. So these are then loaded into the RNA-induced uh, silencing complex, or RISC. 
And for microRNAs, this can include multiple different uh, argonaut proteins. These are then thought to interact with target transcripts, particularly in the 3' UTR, though not exclusively, um, to trigger changes in mRNA stability and or translational repression. So there's a very simplified version of a very complex process, but it gives you the, the major points. For RNAi, what we're doing is we're accessing this naturally occurring pathway to silence genes at a couple of different points. If you're using an shRNA, you're actually uh, triggering this earlier on. You're trying to mimic a microRNA so that it's processed, loaded into argonaut. But then what you will try and do is force the pathway through the selection of your sequence into this uh, pathway. So you get targeted transcripts and transcript cleavage. You do not get this type of, of model here. You're targeting the CDS, the coding region, and you're actually a, a attempting to get cleavage. So here, if you have a, an SI, though, you're just coming into the uh, pathway at a lower point. You're coming just into straight into the cytoplasm. It's going to be loaded into risk, and you're, again, trying to force it down this pathway. And the, the forcing down this pathway is purely based on sequence, um, trying to define that you don't get off-target effects into this part, this pathway. The easiest way to address the, uh, at a practical level uh, whether you have off-target effects is to use different additional and different sequences uh, against your target of interest and ensure that you have a similar phenotype as a consequence of the loss of function. So in a very simplified form, uh, what you're seeing when you're inducing gene-specific RNA is you want to optimize delivery of your reagents. This is pretty much now set. We've been doing this now for over 10, nearly 15 years. Um, so standard um, methods for delivering synthetic sRNAs are based on lipid translations. You only need to get into the cytoplasm. So these are usually pretty high efficacy. There are some resistant cell lines, and it's still very difficult to deliver to um, lymphocyte cells. I'm sorry, testing the wrong thing. Um, it's still hard to, de um, to deliver to cells that are grown in suspension. SHRNAs express either in plasmas and then in viral vectors uh, can overcome that issue. And they also have the advantage, as I say, that these can integrate and you can have long-term silencing. So you have to optimize all of these features to uh, be sure you have good loss of function. But actually, what we found in the end has always been very critical is the development of really good assays. This is going to apply whether you're using uh, RNAi or using CRISPR or any technology. You need really good assays that assess whether the, the quality and quantity of your knockdown at an mRNA protein and function level, particular a protein level. And uh, a lot of the problems we've had over the years, and I was just reiterating this problem, is we've never, we've actually in the end had very few issues with our RNAi reagents. We've had a lot of problems over the years with our antibodies. And so that's usually uh, the problem with that. So I'm then going to turn on to talons. So these are a very different uh, approach. And these are going to induce, uh, at a DNA level, a uh, frame shift mutations. I have to be careful with my hands. Um, and this can result in a permanent knockdown. Um, and they it uses, uh, as a guide, uh, DNA binding domains. Well, I'm going to show you what those look like in a little more detail in a moment. These, again, you need the transcriptome. Um, but if you are um, the at a genome level, you require the dimerization of uh, two enzymes. And this can cause issues in terms of, of off-target effects. Um, again, you can target all variants uh, if there's a conserved region. There's another flavor of, of talent technology, which I'll talk about in, in a minute that's shown here. All right, so tails, they make use of synthetic proteins that are based on the proteins secreted by Xanthophilus, uh, a, a gram-negative bacteria. And these can infect a very wide variety of plant species. And what they have is that they make use of DNA binding domains that contain 7 to 34 homologous direct repeats of 33 to 35 amino acids. So they're repeat structures. And these can be designed to recognize very specific DNA motifs. Okay. Now, this makes very big, bulky effector molecules. The specificity of each tail is therefore contained within the two amino acids that are just at positions 12 and 13 of each of these repeats. And this is known as the repeat variable di-residue. So designing these is really difficult. 
So it should be said that this is, a, there are a lot of, of companies that will actually do the designs for you because these are difficult to design. It's one of those things, don't do this at home type situations. Okay. Each target site in the genome requires double stranded DNA binding domains of between 500 and 7,000 amino acids. So as I say, these are complex effector molecules. This is probably why they never really caught on. Um, so here's a structure. You have your left talon here, which has these multiple DNA binding domains here. This is from just one of the companies that I chose not for any specific reason. I'm not advocating this company in any way. It's just had a pretty picture that I could use. So keep it there. Uh, you have another uh, um, talon here. And these are then fused to nuclease affected domains from FOC1. And these act as a dimer. And then if they will introduce DNA double-stranded breaks, and if you have both of this, you get very few off-target effects, but you do need both. But that means you've got to be able to get these domains to work for you um, on either side, which, is, as I say, there's just not a lot of space sometimes to find uh, ways for these to work. If you have a, a donor DNA you can, and homologous recombination repair, you can introduce non-random point mutations, targeted deletions, or you can add in a whole DNA fragment. If, if these are repaired through error-prone non-homologous end joining, you can get deletions, assertions, or substitutions, frame shifts, or mutations, and truncations. But these are all permanent changes to the genome that will then reflect on uh, changes in gene expression. So there are alternatives ways of doing this where you use the same way of, of targeting uh, the genome, but you're now using uh, the tail to bring into context with the transcriptional start site a domain that will fuse to the transcriptional start site and will block transcription. So this is a tails type silencing. This is, it's not reversible, but it is, um, or it can be reversible, but, but rarely. Um, the biggest problem with this is you need to test a lot of sites within the transcriptional start site to ensure that you don't, you get very effective silencing. Uh, if there's uh, a lot of high nucleosome occupancy, there's things, that, literally things in the way, the tails won't be able to bind. Um, and if you use them as a monomer, uh, you'll get a lot of off-target effects because it can bind in a lot of different places. So there were pros and cons to a lot of these methods that I put forward. I just want you to be aware of them. But a lot of this has obviously changed with the development of functional genomics tools based on CRISPR technology. And just out of curiosity, this is for my own benefit. So how many people are actually doing CRISPR experiments in their labs now? A couple, few. Okay, that's good. No, no, that's good. Okay, so I know, again, I just want to make sure that everybody that, those that aren't, what is feasible and what is not feasible using these methodologies. So Cas, if you're using a standard Cas9 nuclease, these can be used to generate frame shifts and DNA mutations. I'm going to go into that in a different, in a few moments in more detail. These can include permanent knockouts. Um, and usually the, gu the guide is done as a single guide RNA. And I'm going to look, talk about that in a moment, as you will see. The required, the required information is the whole transcriptome, uh, but you're actually cutting at the genome. And if you're cut using a monomer, and you'll see this in a minute, the off-target space can be quite large. Cas9 is a very promiscuous enzyme. It can target lots of places. There are flavors of CRISPR, and I've said there's so many different flavors. You know, every week there's a new way of using it. Uh, but the, broadly speaking, there's ways of repressing um, transcription or activating transcription. And I'm going to just show models of this in a, in a few minutes. OK. So as I'm sure most of you are aware, uh, Cas9, or the, the enzyme Cas9, was first identified from Streptococcus pygenes. Um, and that's the most widely used Cas9 that's available, though there are increasingly different uh, enzymes that have been generated and they're going to be uh, exploited in different ways that they have slightly different uh, features that may make them better or, or worse, um, or probably more importantly, don't have pattern positions associated with them, which I think is going to be a major fight here. Um, Cas9 has innate nuclease activity. And so what you're doing is using a targeting a CRISPR uh, CRNA, which is shown in my model here, combined with a transactivating RNA to uh, locate this enzyme at a site specifically where you where it's required and you want to induce uh, a cut. 
So I'm showing you here in the original form where you had the transcript activating RNA and the CRISPR uh, RNA were separate, but you can actually put them together as a single guide RNA, which is what most people think of in these circumstances. So here you're seeing a model with a single guide RNA that has all the features. And this is the key part in terms of two key parts. This is where you've got the homology with the sequence that you want to target, and then this PAM sequence that's here, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So the constant region of the, of the S of the single guide interacts with the Cas9, and then the variable region, which is shown here, will interact with the genome target, usually of about 17 to 20 nucleotides. Now, the major specificity domain is this proto space, a spacer that's adjacent uh, motif, this PAM motif, which is at the three prime end of the target sequence, the PAM sequence. And for the Cas9 that most individual uh, groups are using, it, the sequence is just an NGG that you have to recognize. So those are relatively common, which is again actually talks to the, cat, to the uh, risk for off target effects in that that's going to be represented enough in the genome that's going to make it a problem to find, to, to find unique sites. So ways have been found around that, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But this is just talking about some of the strategies that people have used. Uh, as I say, there's endless and continual different ways of doing this now. You can use this system to introduce insertion and deletions. insertion and deletions using non-homologous end joining. If you introduce a, a plus a, a donor DNA, you can then enter in it with an insertion or a replacement through homology directed repair. And in fact, in the context, if you have two different uh, Cas9 and plus guides that are going to site uh, that will link to two sites, you can uh, plus a donor uh, DNA, you can induce a homology directed repair that completely rearranges um, the DNA. And this has been used in a number of cases to try and mimic uh, translocation uh, breakpoints. So other ways of using Cas9 is to use them fused to a vector domain, such that you're just now using it as a locator within the uh, genome. And here, you, you usually uh, groups make use of a, a a dead Cas9. So it's a nucleus deficient Cas9, and there are lots of different flavors, again, of those. And they can be fused to a repressor domain, just like I was saying with the talons, such as crab, which will uh, locate next door to a transcriptional start site, again, that represses uh, transcription, uh, usually by a uh, targeted site about a 500 base pairs down from the transcriptional start site. You can activate by using something like VP64 that will actually allow for transcription or even just using it for visualization. So they can, uh, it can be linked to a fluorescent protein such as GFP and allow you to see exactly uh, um, particular information about, uh, about the genome. Now, I've mentioned as I've gone along uh, some aspects about off-target effects, and these, no technology is perfect. And anyone that tells you that isn't really doing real experiments, you have to Think about this in all contexts, and I've come through some of the issues in relation to the technology there. In the context of CRISPR, one of the key is that particularly the dead Cas9, the nucleus can bind to a large number of off-target set, sets. And if you have, if the guide is there's too much guide, you will get a lot of off-target effects. One of the ways that a lot of groups are now increasingly using uh, to addre uh, address this is if you use in the case of trying to do homology directed repair is if you use paired nuclei uh, nicases. So this is again an addition mutation into the nucleases so that they're now nicases. And that, that can reduce uh, the off target effects. And also there's increasingly discussion about using dual guides to reduce uh, off target effects and increase efficiency of the process. So the first part of this talk, really all I wanted to do is to make sure everybody is familiar within the uh, the CCR with all of the different options that are available. Um, there are lots and lots of lots of reviews now and lots of uh, options for you to look at on websites. So I've decided just not to do this anymore, to go into these in details, that will look at how to apply these to different systems in, in an individual lab. So what I've decided to really focus on is the stuff you can't do in your own labs. Uh, to give you a flavor of what maybe you could build in with PIs or where the field on a bigger scale is going by really focusing on screening-based analysis. 
and I'm going to do talk about so first of all some sort of state of the art uh, papers that just came out looking at CRISPR screens in cancer cell lines, and then I'm going to talk about at the end some of the work from my lab of uh, doing screens in the context of gene function analysis, and then looking at gene drug analysis. So the uh, papers that I'm going to talk about in the context of CRISPR screens in cancer cells uh, came out in, I think, August in, in Cancer Discovery. And the two back-to-back -back papers, I'm just going to, again, because of time, conscious, uh, focus on one of these, which is this Monzo et al. Uh, but the other paper complements, and I would encourage you to, 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 re to look at both of these. This uh, figure is actually from a, a commentary on uh, these uh, papers and just sort of summarizes the two elements of the, uh, that I want to go through and then I'm going to discuss the Monzo paper in more detail because it's going to give up some information both about how to do screening with CRISPR but also some things about what we need to think about when we're applying CRISPR reagents. So the study from Agura et al um, did, performed CRISPR screens in 33 cell lines. So they had to make Cas9, high expressing Cas9 uh, lines for each of these uh, uh, cell lines, so 33 of them. They then screened uh, basically the whole genome. Um, and they did it with a depth of, of about six uh, um, single gu uh, guides uh, RNAs per gene. Um, the plating uh, for ratio this was done as a lentiviral um, transducer, as a whole library. They used about 500 cells per guide on average. In the Monzo et al. paper, they did a slight variation. They only did five cell lines but they and less genes, but they then did 20 guides per gene. So you get slightly different information from each paper, which is why it's advantage to, to look at both of them. Um, and they looked at actually slightly more cells per uh, S, uh, single guide. Now, what both papers came out was a list of essential genes for all cancer cells. They found lists of genes for uh, cancer cells that are related to the mutations that were carried by these different cancer cell lines. What they both genes, uh, both papers, I should say, also revealed the copy number it can lead to a number of false positives in these screens. And it's that that I'm going to talk about uh, in a moment in relationship to the Monzo paper. But I'm first of all going to introduce you a little bit more to how uh, they went about this screen and how they actually compared it with an shRNA screen. So I thought that would be useful for this audience. So what they took was a uh, Cas9 lines. So one of the things that we've, uh, the whole field has, has discovered and has, has reinforces repeatedly is that the, the most efficient to get good CRISPR, you need really good expressing Cas9 lines um, that are robust and are well selected and very uh, homogeneous. They in, um, in, uh, infected these either with a library of, of shRNAs or a library of CRISPRs. So these were viral pools, 20 reagents per gene, targeting 2,700 genes. They then left these cells for 14 days and then they did a deep sequencing to find out what was the ratio of the sequences that, uh, that were represented in uh, these populations. So reagents that uh, were targeting specific genes but that were lost after 14 days were assumed to be essential. So when you take out those genes either by shRNA or by CRISPR, if they've now depleted, those genes must be essential for, for viability of these cells. And here is just showing the data for DLD1 cells, a uh, uh, colorectal cancer, and SF268, which I think, anyone remember what two, anyone know what those are? Okay. I think they're a brain tumor line, I can't remember. Um, and what they're showing here is the correlation here between the average z-score, so this is a average of the scores for the entire um, library that they've looked, or every, every um, a, a CRISPR reagent that they've looked at, where the negative z-score here represents cell death, and where a positive uh, the score will translate into um, a uh, proliferish, proliferation. So this is the scores for the CRISPR along here on the x-axis and on the y-axis we have the scores for the shRNA. And on the whole they correlate pretty well actually. Most of these are here but what you do see is in this quadrant here and here that there are uh, single guides 
that are giving uh, an essential phenotype uh, by CRISPR that are not being picked up by shRNA. And so the conclusion was, was that there is an improvement. You do see an improvement over shRNAs in detection of essential genes in this context. Some are here where you've got genes that are, they're just showing here some examples of essential genes that were found by both uh, methodologies. So they also then, because they had screened enough cell lines that had different mutations, you can look to see what, what genes are perhaps uh, are selective across all cancers and, and which ones may be related to the mutations that these uh, cell lines uh, are harboring. So in this case, this is the cell lines across the bottom here, and then these are the mutations that they carry. So you have genes that where they're lost either by CRISPR or with shRNA or frankly with sRNAs under all kinds of if you take out PS, PCNA, all cells will die. And you see these pan lethal genes. Uh, PLK is another one. And then uh, the proteasome uh, gene PSMA4 is also represented here. Then you have some that are related to, to genetic dependencies. So here you have a cell line HT1080s that have NRAS mutations. And you see that they are very susceptible to uh, uh, decreases in the expression of MBM2 and NRAS, which you would expect. Uh, also, if you carry an MD uh, here, the MET uh, and BRAF mutated cell lines are also sensitive to MBM2 uh, knockout. Uh, the BRAF PI3, uh, PIK3CA mutant is, uh, again, very, uh, shows a lethality when you knock out uh, PIK3A. So you can pick up these um, dependencies uh, in a very robustly with these screens. Uh, a lot of these have been previously identified by RNAi screens, but it confirms that these are, are working effectively too. Uh, there are also some here where we're seeing that these are non-expressed and these are not coming up as false positive, and that's important. So these genes are not expressed. They should not show any uh, dependency, and we see no. Okay. So that's good. However, uh, now one of the things that they also looked at was what what gave mo the most effective uh, robust phenotypes following uh, a CRISPR knockout? And they plotted this here for four genes, beta catenin PLK1, urokinase B, and SMARCA2. Uh, and what you're looking at here is where you have the literally amino acid by amino acid positions, the where the positions of the CRISPR guide, the, the uh, single guide RNAs are uh, mapped to. And taking uh, probably the SMAC2 is the easiest way. What they uh, had looked at was seeing that those uh, single guides that corresponded to sequences that are related to domains that are very conserved in these protein, fam in protein families, these are the most effective in generating a phenotype. Uh, those that are in more variable domains don't seem to be as effective. And this is very interesting because at the early days of CRISPR, everyone was focused on actually targeting the most five primed end of these uh, genes, thinking that that would then block out expression across the whole um, gene. But actually, it's been discovered, and this was actually consistent with another study that was published in Nature, Te Nature Technology in 2015 that saw the same effect that actually, you want to really do is target um, the very key domain to really shut down if you edit at those points, you will not get expression and you get a very robust phenotype. It's also worth noting that, for example, here for beta catenin, that they saw uh, single guys that were targeting the most five prime end of the coding region were completely ineffective. And that's actually because there's alternative uh, translation initiation sites in exon three. And so you really do need to know exactly where you're targeting and it really does help. A lot of companies that are making CRISPR agents are increasingly using these sorts of information to uh, guide how you would, no pun intended, guide how you would design your guides. Um, but th so this is this is some of the biology behind that. So the paper uh, has helped us improve thinking about how we would design these guides, but it also revealed uh, an, an interesting an interesting problem. So what they noted in this study was that there were a number of what looked like false positives in the screen, in that these were genes where they were seeing, here we're seeing the, the CRISPR average z-score. So they were picking up these as hits in the screen, but these were actually not showing up. And actually what I, what I want to highlight is the orange dots. 
They were coming up as hits in the screens, but they were not coming up as hits in the shRNA. And more importantly, these orange dots actually represent genes that are just not expressed when you put it against RNA-seq data. What they found was when they looked at the mapping of these, these all mapped to amplified regions in the genome in these cells. So just taking one of these cases here, this is in cell line M M MKN245, I think. Um, MKN45, thank you, uh, which is a gastric tumor. So there's an amplicon here that contains MET. So MET is the clear driver in this amplicon, and you would anticipate that when you knock out MET, you should indeed induce a phenotype. But what they saw was actually that if you knocked out any gene in this region, including those that were actually non-expressed, which is what's shown in orange here, these are actually unexpressed genes, they were generating a phenotype. And what these uh, groups, and I realized I hadn't put in this slide, what they had uh, found was that actually what you were seeing is site-specific DNA damage. This induces G2 cell arrest and then decreased cell proliferation, which is, appears as a completely false positive. So this is now something that, again, needs to be taken into account when thinking about experimentation when you're targeting a gene that's actually in an amplified region that you may actually be disrupting uh, the expression of genes throughout that amplicon. So there's never anything that's perfect, unfortunately. So um, I now wanted to turn in the final two uh, sort of vignettes um, to a couple of studies from my lab that are focused on sRNA screening. Um, and I'm going to start by uh, looking at a project that we've been engaged with for some time. Um, and uh, the first part of which was actually, the first study of which was published earlier this year. And this was a genome-wide screen of EWS fly one activity. And I'm going to explain what that is in a minute. So this is, this is now going from looking at one gene or another to genome-wide, but on an arrayed setting. So slightly different. So what is EWS fly one? Just as an introduction. Um, so this is, encodes an oncogenic transcription factor. And it's associated with uh, uh, the development of viewing sarcoma. So EWS fly one, the transcription, uh, it deregulates the expression of about a thousand genes. It activates some and it represses others. And it's absolutely required for the malignant transformation that's seen in Ewing sarcoma, a pediatric uh, bone or soft tissue uh, tumor. Currently, the only treatments for this sarcoma is intensive chemotherapy and radiation surgery. And though the uh, overall survival rate is, is increased in the last few years. If you have a recurrent or relapsed disease or you, uh, there's metastatic disease at diagnosis, actually the overall survival rate is less than, it's around 30%. So while this is rare, this is a major part of CCR's mission to try and find a new, uh, more targeted treatments for these and other types of pediatric tumors. So what I became involved in with was conducting a genome-wide RNA screen of EWS fly one activity using a reporter assay. So this is now you know, a, a very um, effective way of looking at uh, transcriptional activity. What uh, This was built originally by the pediatric oncology branch at CCR for a drug screen. And it consists of two cell lines uh, where one is expressing luciferase from a, uh, a promoter of a known target of EWS fly one, NROB1. And then there's a second line where is it, uh, that expresses uh, the luciferase from a CMV. And by comparing the relative luciferase level in the context of three sRNAs per gene and 21,000 genes, you can start to find out genes that are absolutely required for EWS fly one activity because you'd anticipate you should see more of a reduction in the signal here than in this cell line. So my lab optimized this assay for RNA screening. This then, the assay was then actually performed at the TransNIH RNAi screening facility, which I'm going to talk about more a little at the end. Um, and this is the rep, you know, this represents two years work <laughs> in one graph. And what we're doing here is we're plotting here the data for the control uh, cell line, the CMV luciferase. Again, this is the Z values that I was talking about earlier. So this is normalized to show here we've got a reduction in the uh, signal from this cell line in the, of luciferase in this signal. Here's an increase. And then here's the NROB1 signal. So this is the EWS fly1 uh, selective uh, signal. 
And I'm showing you here the sRNAs. Uh, there were two sRNAs to, uh, against, S, uh, against FLY1 that actually map to the fusion and two that map from EWSR1 that also match the fusion. And we see that both of those induce a, a significant reduction in the luciferase signal with the NROB1 assay, but not the CMV. Uh, the other sequences that do not match to the fusion show no activity. This is illustrated here in more detail. We're showing the, uh, the difference. So here, what we can do to try and find out where these uh, genes are what are our major targets is we can take the value from one from the other to find the difference between them. So we're taking the luciferase value, uh, um, taking the luciferase value and subtracting the CMV value. And anything that has a Z difference that's less than one, we're considering as reducing EWS fly one activity specifically. And this is showing this calculation based for these sRNAs against uh, the EWS fly one fusion. So what we could do that is do that for the entire transcriptome. And actually, rather to our surprise at the time, uh, we found that actually the functional term that was most frequently associated with genes or required for EWS fly one activity was RNA processing. And this is another thing to bear in mind when you are conducting screens on this, value, this, on this scale, whether this is actually a compound screen or a CRISPR screen or an RNA screen, you need to stay as unbiased as possible for as long as possible. You don't want to go in with too many preconceived ideas. And so what my lab decided to do, or I encouraged, or we went ahead, was trying to find the mechanistic basis for why RNA processing would be there. And I wanted to tell you this story in a little, on looking at just one of these proteins. This is this one here, h and and PH1, because I want to use it to also show you how we've applied RNAi to look at a specific functions of specific genes in some cases. So here is looking at uh, the data. I'm sort of highlighting this part of the of the screening data here in more detail, showing it here. So this is the result for H and R and PH1. And here what we've done is taken additional sRNAs and, and compare, uh, done the same assay and showed that in all cases, silencing this gene reduces the expression uh, from this NROB or luciferase reporter versus the CM reporter, similarly to if you were taking out EWS fly one directly. Again, this is where in the context of RNAi, what we're using is multiple sRNAs to confirm our observation. So we're as sure as we can be that this is not an off-target effect. So what we uh, looked at then was to see well, what is the effect on EWS fly one expression. And it should be seen that we, we, were, we were gratified, but we're a bit confused that what we saw was that there was a significant decrease in EWS fly one expression uh, when we knocked out HNR and PH1. So now we have a hypothesis that H and R and PH1 is in some way required for EWS fly one expression. We see this also at a protein level, that we see that the protein comes down when we knock down uh, H and R and PH1. So we built a hypothesis that H and R and PH1 is required for the processing of EWS fly one pre mRNAs. And because we know H and R and PH1 is involved in alternative splicing, we wondered if this might play a role in uh, whether we were making an in or out of frame. Uh, EWS fly one. And this is how we uh, were able to actually uh, understand what was, was going on. We went into the literature and the very first description that is now over 20 years old of the cell line that we did the screen in is a cell line called TC32. And buried away in this was a description that actually they were picking up when they were characterizing the fusion that it was actually evidence of alternative splicing. Subsequent studies that, are, that actually were fortunately published as we were starting to look at this data show that actually the breakpoints in TC32 cells and another, another cell line I'm going to talk about, SKMC cells, the breakpoint in these cell lines is actually downstream in the chromosome 22 uh, um, low site EWSL1. It's downstream of this exon, exon 8. To make an in-frame fusion, this exon 8 has to be spliced out. And what we are able to identify is that when you silence H and R and PH1, that has an effect on EWS fly one only in the cell lines that have this exon 8 containing um, chromosomal uh, translocation. Cell lines that actually have breakpoints between exon 6 and exon 7 or between exon, actually I'm not, I'm not, between exon 7 and exon 8, they don't care about this. And that's examples here. 
So this is shown in another way here where we look at the protein in TC32 cells when we knock out HMPH1, ISKM, CAC, we see a decrease in EWS fly 1 is because we now know these cells can't splice out this exon, whereas in TC71 cells and RDS cells, they maintain the protein. What this allows us to do is actually show them what is the consequence of this. As I said, the EWS fly 1 is a transcription factor. It deregulates the gene, uh, expression of many, many, many genes. And what we've done here is then look to compare what happens to SKMC cells with Ewing sarcoma cell lines versus the TC71 cells. And we've shown that when we silence HNRMPH1 in these cells, we decrease the expression of activated targets and we increase the expression of uh, repressed targets. And we have no effect here in the context of TC71 cells, which have no dependence on this. We can see this at a protein level. And I say, always multiple siRNAs to uh, ensure we have specificity. This leads to actually a selectivity effect on the inhibition of the growth of these cells. So if we silence HNR and PH1, we see, only see an effect in the cell lines that have the particular breakpoint, the TC32 cells, and we see no effect on the cell lines that don't. Now, we've estimated that there are about 40% of, of Ewing sarcoma tumors actually have this breakpoint downstream of exon A, and we've now do, uh, developed an entire program actually trying to see if we can understand exactly how HRMPH1 is uh, interacting to exclude this um, exon, and if that's a, something that's amenable and can be targeted in these tumors. So in the last final minutes or so, I then wanted to just turn um, to another approach that we've used uh, RNAi screening in, where we've used it in the context of chemosensitization screens. And this is where we're using RNAi to see if we can find additional targets that actually uh, increase the uh, assist, increase the sensitivity of cells to a particular uh, drug. And we've done this in a number of contexts in breast cancer. So why would we do this? Well, RNAi-based analysis of drug activity or combinations with other uh, functional genetic tools that I've discussed earlier, it has the potential that you can uh, use it to identify synergistic molecular targets for combination uh, uh, treatment so that these may uh, exploit complementary vulnerabilities. You can use lower concentrations of drug in some case. You can overcome drug resistance. And you may also be able to broaden the clinical application to other cancer types. So what I'm going to talk today is about a study that was published uh, a couple of years ago now that I conducted with Stan Lipovitz, uh, now of the Women's Malignancy uh, Branch in the Center of Cancer Research. And, Lee, and um, Stan was very interested in this uh, in TRAIL, which is a tumor necrosis factor related apoptosis inducing ligand. Uh, so this can trigger the uh, apoptotic intrinsic pathway. And it's become a, a potential target uh, in breast cancer. But there are some breast cancers that are very resistant uh, to trial. And so what we wanted to do was try and see if we can find the predictive biomarkers for why uh, some cell lines are, res are uh, respond to trial and some others, and then look for combination strategies. So we ended up conducting three different screens where we were at the screening actually different endpoints in the apoptotic extrinsic pathway. We were looking in first screen at whether we were activating caspase 8. We were looking at a second screen where we were looking at activated caspase 3.7 downstream of the activation of the uh, intrinsic pathway by trail. And then the final screen was just a straightforward loss of viability as triggered by its consequence of apoptosis. So we conducted parallel RNAi screens. We focused initially on the kinome and the phosphatome. We also threw in another 350 additional genes for various reasons. And these screens were all done in the absence and presence of trial in a cell line that was se sensitive to, um, to trial, but where we could move the needle, where we could move and make them somewhat more sensitive and then see if we could then take that into other cell lines. And as I say, our endpoints were caspase 37, caspase 8, and cell viability. So to do this, as with any screen, and it's absolutely essential, whatever screen you're doing, you have to have really good controls for all of the different assays that we were looking. We spent a lot of time having to find different uh, ways of being able to measure uh, the activity of this screen. And eventually, we were able to show that we were able to use uh, caspase 8 and um, flip. If we silence these, caspase 8 acts as a 
to suppress the activation, obviously by taking out caspase 8, whereas FLIP, which acts as an inhibitor of the intrinsic pathway, actually if you silence that, that will actually increase your signal. So we were able to get one, uh, controls that both decrease our signal and increase our signal relative to controls. So this is then showing the relative uh, uh, correlation of the different screens in the, present, in the absence of trial or in the presence of trial. Um, so this is a really complicated set of figures, but what we were trying to do from this was just show that there was some correlation, at least between caspase 8 and caspase 3, 7 activation. Um, and there was actually pretty good, reasonable correlation in some cases uh, between uh, caspase 3, 7 and cell viability. We had a lot of problems with the caspase 8 activation screen, and that actually had to be deprioritized um, during, uh, as part of our analysis. So I'm showing you here uh, one of the data sets where we were looking for putative regulators of the trail mediated caspase 3, 7 activation. So we're looking here at the relative uh, activation of caspase 3, 7 on this axis. We have different genes across here. We have the set of controls here. And we were looking in this at, at 83 kinases and four phosphatases and 60 other genes that are actually we, we did, deemed as hits in this screen. So the, the very open circles represent where we have no trail. And then this is where we have added trail plus the knockdown, and we see a significant increase in the relative level of caspase 3.7. And I'm just going to highlight here some of the uh, hits in it, which one would expect, such as BCL2L1 and BCL2L2, uh, L2, um, and then also uh, other um, Burk, uh, Burk compound uh, genes and other inhibitors of apoptosis. So when we silence these, we see these uh, are triggers. So we were able to uh, model how this looked in, in all of the different assays. I'm just showing you here the data for BCLXL um, and also for FGFR4 and focus on whether these could then actually sensitize other cell lines. So what we're looking at here is where we took some of our leading hits. I'm just going to focus on the BCL2L1 here where we then, as so this was where the screen was done in MB231 cells. Uh, this is the four different sRNAs against this screen. And what I'm representing here is that where you have a very dark brown, and this is where there was a significant enhancement in trial sensitivity. And what we're able to take is actually relatively resistant cell line, SKBR3 cells. So we have here sort of a, a, a um, different levels of resistance across these cell lines. We could take a relatively resistant cell line. And when we knocked out some of these genes, we were now able to make them sensitive to, to trial. Um, Dr. Lipovitz's group was then able to try and uh, use this by combining with uh, BCL2, uh, XL, BCL2, and BCLW uh, inhibitor. Uh, it's a pan inhibitor, ABT737, and show that this in combination with trial does now sensitize some of the resistant cell lines. So we were able to take highly resistant cell lines and now make them sensitive, which is sort of the object of the exercise. But one of the problems we had was that it was really hard to understand the mechanistic basis for what a lot of the hits that we found. So BCL1, CERC1, some of these were easy, and, but a lot of them were actually more difficult. And so one of the re things we realized quick, right, quickly was that we were actually going to need more data, that 1,000 genes was not enough to make sense of an entire pathway. And so this is one of the projects that actually was expanded and has been accepted into the pipeline of the trans-RNAi screening facility. Just in the last minute, I just wanted to mention this facility to, to you. Um, this is a facility that actually spun out of my lab now over six years ago. Um, and basically what it is is a fully automated RNAi screening system. We are also now just putting, starting to put CRISPR into the pipeline, not as full screens yet, but as for validation downstream of the RNAi screens with the aim of being able to adapt our workflow for CRISPR screening, hopefully in the next period, depending on money and resources and smart ideas. We'll, we'll see where. Now, we can screen at the facility uh, lots of simple phenotypes, some of which I've just, just described to you, cell viability, cytotoxic, cytotoxicity. You can do luciferase assays, as I've described earlier, for, for the EWS fly one activity. We're now increasingly, though, and, and almost actually in the last bunch of, of, of projects that went, to really doing almost all high content imaging, um, which is exciting. but a little more expensive, uh, particularly those that require antibodies. So that's a bit of a problem, but we're, we're managing so far. 
And what is really fun, though, is that this is a facility, because it's a trans NIH, that has worked in many, many different project areas. Uh, cancer, we've gone from everything from drug enhancement and resistance screens, similar to the screen that I outlined uh, for trail, and to say that's now actually within the pipeline of the facility. Lots of different cancer types that have been looked at, and then very specific pathways um, that are going. But this is also expanded to a study throughout the NIH, looking at different infectious diseases, uh, other disease-related phenotypes, and, and actually just very fundamental cell biology. Now, I'm just pointing this out because if you want to do a, a screen, you have to get your PI to write a proposal to do this. This doesn't just happen, but this costs a great deal of money, and you have to be very disciplined doing it. But a lot of projects that have come into the facility have really started from postdocs. So I always encourage you to, to think about it and think big. So I'm going to finish there, and in the last couple of minutes, I'm happy to take a few questions. So just out of interest, so people that are doing CRISPR, how are you, how are you finding it? Because we're, we're sort of trying to get a sense, actually, we're on campus of, of how, how many people are using it, what, is their, what are they using it for, and, and what, what might be needed to, to, to sort of make it become more effective for people at a, you know, on an individual basis and then also perhaps on a, on a larger scale basis. Anyone willing to actually say something? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I yes, and my postdoc would agree with you. <laughs> uh, there doesn't seem to be a short answer to that one. I think there are new reagents, but I think the guys that, are, that everybody is aware that that is one of the bottlenecks, um, and definitely we're beta testing. We, that's the fun bit. I get to beta test a lot of these things, some of which will never see the light of day, but that is fun. Where, you know, if we can increase that efficiency just that little bit, you don't have to screen quite so many clones and it's not quite so much in. Any, any other issues people are finding? No? Well, okay. All right. Thank you. Lecture. Our next speaker is Len Nickers. He got his PhD from the University of Connecticut. And he did postdoctoral training at NIH and joined NCI in 1981. He's chief of the tumor cell biology section. And uh, his key contribution is he identified the molecular chaperone HSP90 as a key factor in cancer. And then he discovered inhibitors for HSP90, including galdanomycin and 17AAG. So he's going to talk to us today about the HSP90 molecular chaperone, a housekeeping protein hijacked by cancer cells. Len. Thank you very much. Uh, so yes, I want to uh, give those of you that aren't familiar with molecular chaperones a bit of information as to why, on the one hand, they can be considered part of the housekeeping machinery and you might think kind of boring in that sense. Uh, they're actually not because they're very important in maintaining the viability of cancer cells. And I'm going to get into a little bit of rationale as to how that appears to be the case. Uh, so HSP90 exists as a dimer. And what's shown on the left here is uh, a molecule of HSP90. Uh, you can see that uh, it's it, the dimerization do domain is down here in the C-terminal part of the protein. Uh, this N-terminal part, as you'll see, is where nucleotides bind as well as a number of inhibitors that we and others have identified. Uh, where'd everybody go? <laughs> so they should be advancing, but it's not. Hello? <laughs> it's just, I'm trying to advance the slides for, for my computer. It's not working.
Okay. Thank you. All right. So what are molecular chaperones? So they're uh, components of the proteostasis machinery of a cell, uh, which in, I'll show you in, in a slide includes things like the proteasome, for example. Uh, molecular chaperones are, participate in the folding of proteins as they're synthesized off of ribosomes. They're also involved in quality control of proteins that are misfolded and after repeated attempts by, by the cell can't be folded, so they have to be degraded. Uh, and, HS, and also in the uh, maintenance of activity and stability of proteins that are activatable by a ligand. For example, an uh, androgen receptor is activated by androgen, glucocorticoid receptor is activated by glucocorticoid. Uh, and HSP90 is involved in maintaining the conformation of these proteins so that they can recognize the ligand. So other molecular chaperones participate in general folding of proteins. HSP90 has a major role to play in quality control of misfolded proteins as well as in this maintenance of uh, and at the activation state, as well as the stability of its client. So, as I mentioned, molecular chaperones and HSP90 in particular are key components of what's become known as the proteostasis machinery or network. And, and these include uh, the lysosome, which is important for autophagy. So, they're are HSP90 dependent clients that are important for autophagy, in, including the kinase ULK1. HSP90 also interacts with chaperonins like TRIC, shown on the left of, of the slide. Uh, it regulates to some extent the major heat shock transcription factor in the cell. So, this is a stress response transcriptional. Uh, set of genes that are regulated by HSF1. And in fact, there's a unique set of genes that HSF1 drives in cancer. HSP90 is also associated with the proteasome through several E3 proteins like chips that promote ubiquitination of HSP90 clients. It works together with other chaperones, including HSP40 and HSP70, particularly in the chaperoning of nuclear receptors. And it's intimately involved in the endoplasmic reticulum stress response, otherwise known as the unfolded protein response, or UPR, because two of the mediators of this response, IRE1 and PERC, are kinases whose kinase do domain is in the cytosol and is regulated by association with HSP90. So, what the, I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make with this slide is that a, HSP90 is really a key component of multiple aspects of proteostasis. So in normal cells, HSP90 is in excess. I, it's thought to make up, on average, about 3% of the protein of a normal cell, which if you think about it, for one protein, that's a huge amount. And uh, it's not clear why it's in such excess, but it, it, it is. Uh, in cancer cells, it's much more difficult to maintain uh, the uh, phenomenon of proteostasis because, as I'll show you, there are a lot of stresses that are constantly impacting a cancer cells that's trying to disrupt this process. And, and so maintaining the proteostasis of cancer cells is much more difficult. And so HSP90 under these conditions is limiting. And in fact, it's limiting even though it's more highly expressed in cancer cells than in normal cells. It can be five to 6% of the total protein in cancer cells versus 3% in normal cells. So there's a tremendous amount of this protein in most cancer cells. 
These are the stresses on the left in yellow that HSP9, that, that, that cancer cells need to deal with almost constantly. So there's uh, nutrient stress because cancers can outgrow their blood supply. There's proteotoxic stress because uh, if reactive oxygen is generated or the, the cells are hypoxic, uh, you can get damage to proteins in the cell and this damage needs to be repaired or the proteins need to be cleared. And then a, a lot of cancer cells, especially the solid tumor type of cancers, are known for genetic instability and aneuploidy. And this generates a lot of misfolded proteins that uh, just cannot be folded and must be eliminated in order to maintain the viability of the cell. And, and so all of these stresses feed into HSP90 and through a whole series of client proteins shown on the right of this slide, uh, it's, it's able to deal with most of them. And this is why cancer cells really depend on proteostasis in general, but on HSP90 in particular for survival. So if you look at the list of proteins on the right, uh, you can see a lot of them are oncogene. Uh, and uh, it stands to reason why then inhibiting HSP90 might be an option in cancer. So this model uh, I've drawn here is based on yeast, which is actually a very good system to study molecular chaperones in general and HSP90 in particular because there's very uh, close sim similarity between yeast HSP90 and human HSP90. And in fact, human HSP90 can take the place of yeast HSP90 and the yeast are perfectly happy. So again, under normal growth conditions in yeast, uh, HSP90 expression far exceeds the level that is necessary. It was shown more than 20 years ago that you could uh, genetically reduce the expression of HSP90 in yeast that are growing under optimal conditions. You can reduce by 90% and the yeast are perfectly happy. But as soon as you subject them to a, a temperature that's non-optimal, which is a major form of stress for yeast or subject them to nutrient stress. Now, this tremendous excess of HSP90 is barely able to keep them alive. And, and you can generate point mutations in the chaperone that under normal conditions have no phenotype, but when you subject the yeast to stress, all of a sudden they're, they're not able to cope. So if we replace stress with cancer, this model suggests that a little bit of inhibition of HSP90 in cancer cells has a much more pronounced effect than it would have the same amount of inhibition in normal cells. And this actually explains why we're able to inhibit this protein in humans in vivo with very minor toxicity. Mostly it's GI toxicity that, that is easily dealt with. So when clinical trials uh, with 17 AG, which was the first in human HSP90 inhibitor started in the late 90s, everybody thought it would be an impossible thing to do because the toxicity would be so great because HSP90 is a housekeeping protein. You can't inhibit it in normal cells. Well, you can inhibit it in normal cells a little bit without any obvious side effects. And that little bit is, has a pronounced effect on the growth of tumor cells. And, and in fact, there have been a number of studies now, this is one example, it's also true in lung cancer, where the level of HSP90 expressed by the tumor is correlated inversely with either overall survival or risk of recurrence recurrence and met metastasis. So this is in triple negative breast cancer. And you can see if you arbitrarily divide up the tumors of these patients, 
into high HSP90, which would be the red line, or moderate to low HSP90 in the tumor, which would be the black line, there's clearly a highly significant effect on overall survival of, of, the, of these patients. So having a tumor with high levels of HSP90 is generally not a good prognostic factor. So the first point I want to make, and, and perhaps the most important point, is, is that inhibiting HSP90 in and of itself may not necessarily be the, the most effective way to, to use these kinds of drugs. But by inhibiting HSP90, you compromise the robustness of cancer cells. And this allows you to then come in with a second treatment to which the cancer cells are now much more responsive and sensitive. And a good example of this is radiation. So we published a paper quite some time ago now, and this has since been repeated by a number of other groups with a number of other HSP90 inhibitors, that this particular HSP90 inhibitor, 17-AAG, is a radiosensitizing agent in HeLa cells and CHA cells. Uh, and you can see that the dose of 17-AAG that we're using here by itself is not particularly toxic. Uh, so if you look where the dose of radiation is shown along the x-axis, so if, if you look up here, uh, these would be cells just treated with 17-AAG without the radiation. And, and you can see that the way, because this is a log scale here, there's some minor effect on cell growth with the 90 inhibitor alone, but basically using this scale, it's, it's relatively uh, inactive as a single agent. However, when you start to increase the, the dosage of radiation for both cell types, you, you can see that there's a dose-dependent increase in the cytotoxicity. So this surviving fraction is actually a log scale. So you can see that with a relatively low dose of radiation and the higher dose, which is still a very low dose of 17 AG, you get a significant increase in cell kill, uh, more than 100 times. And it's true for both of these lines. There's also a dose dependence to, to, to this effect. These cells uh, on the right are treated with the higher dose of 17 AAG, and then we're looking over time. Each of these uh, curves now is a different time. And, and you can see that there's a time-dependent effect of the cell killing as well. So adding in an HSP90 here definitely sensitizes uh, these cells to radiation. And there's actually a clinical trial that's currently open and enrolling patients where they're using just this type of protocol. They're looking to see if one of the newer HSP90 inhibitors uh, shows any benefit as a sensitizer. So how did we come upon HSP90 inhibitors in the first place? So uh, ATP binding and hydrolysis are essential to the function of HSP90. That's the first thing to understand. This is uh, one protomer of the dimer of HSP90. So a molecule of HSP90 is made up of two of these. Uh, and as it turns out, the end domain shown on uh, the bottom of the slide here happens to be uh, a place where ATP binds. And it doesn't bind to HSP90 like it binds to kinases. It, the binding is, is unique and is only shared by uh, a couple of proteins. So uh, a kinase inhibitor, for example, which competes for ATP binding to a kinase wouldn't uh, inhibit ATP binding to HSP90, nor do HSP90 inhibitors inhibit ATP binding to a kinase. 
they'll inhibit a kinase that's dependent on HSP90, but indirectly by preventing HSP90 from chaperoning the kinase. Anyway, to make a long story short, this ATP binding site in the end domain of HSP90 is druggable, and we identified a couple of natural substances made by bacteria uh, in, the, in, in the early to mid-90s, galdanomycin and radicicol, that sit in this ATP binding pocket, have much higher affinity than ATP does, and can either kick ATP out or prevent ATP from binding. So what are the consequences of this? Well, HSP90 is a very conformationally dynamic protein, and those conformational dynamics are important to its function and are driven by ATP binding and hydrolysis. So this cartoon, what we're showing here, is the so-called open conformation, where the dimerization is maintained through uh, the C-terminal region of the protomers, but the endomains are apart. And when the endomains bind ATP, they start to undergo conformational changes and establish this closed and twisted conformation, which is now uh, com competent to hydrolyze the ATP, uh, which brings the chaperone back to, to this uh, compact conformation and then upon release of ADP back to the open conformation to go through an, another cycle. So clients bind in this open conformation. It was originally thought they bind inside this cleft, but it's more likely now that they're binding to the outside of one of the protomers. But in any case, in the presence of ATP, there is a directed conformational change and during this conformational change, work is done on the client. Uh, and then by ATP hydrolysis, HSP90 is able to get back to the ground state, releasing the client to do whatever it's going to do. So HSP90 inhibitors sit into this ATP binding pocket with high affinity, and they block the dynamics that are directed by ATP binding and hydrolysis. And, and the upshot of this is that client proteins are ubiquitinated and degraded by the proteasome. And we've identified two E3s that can do this. There are likely more. CHIP was the first one that was identified. It's a very unique E3. It can ubiquitinate proteins but it needs to be associated with either HSP90 or HSP70 to do so. So it's perfect to uh, ubiquitinate clients of HSP90. And in fact, we showed that the galdanomycin induced increase in client ubiquitination is markedly reduced if you knock chip out, out, out of the cell. So it's very important in degrading clients in response to HSP90 inhibitor. But it's not the only E3 that's able to do this. Another one we identified a few years later is Cullen-5, uh, which is important for the degradation of, of HIF-1-alpha, for example. So in 2014, this is the list of HSP90 inhibitors in clinical trial. Uh, most of these are synthetic. Uh, even though 17-AAG was, was the first in human HSP90 inhibitor, and, and it, is called, it is known as a benzoquinone ansomycin, uh, ritaspamycin, IPI504, is almost the same as 17-AAG. AAG. But the problem with these compounds is they have a quinone as part of the structure, and, and the quinone can have off-target toxicity. And so people decided to look uh, for uh, HSP90 inhibitors to synthesize HSP90 inhibitors with less toxicity and actually chose the radicicol structure to generate a series of compounds uh, shown here that are in various stages of clinical trial, 
uh, with much, much lower toxicity. Uh, as of now, 2016, there aren't as many trials ongoing for a number of reasons, but a few of these compounds, like, for example, AT13387 uh, and let's see, SNX5422 and PUH71 uh, remain in clinical trial, and there's actually a new compound from a company in Japan that, that entered into clinical trial about a year ago, maybe a little less than that. So there are still some HSP90 inhibitors in phase two trials. No phase three trials have as yet been successful, and so no HSP90 inhibitor has yet been approved by the FDA, so we're still working on that. But there are definite signs of anti-tumor activity in, in patients. So this was an early study published in 2011 showing that in uh, breast cancer patients where the cancer is positive for HER2 and so treatable by an antibody to HER2 called Herceptin, uh, which patients eventually stop responding to, if you then add in an HSP90 inhibitor, you generate a further response. <clears throat> and, and this is to the combination of Herceptin plus the HSP90 inhibitor. And this has now been shown to be true for a number of different HSP90 inhibitors, and it suggests that HER2-positive cancers are likely to be one of the more sensitive cancers to HSP90 in, in, in inhibition. If you're not familiar with these waterfall plots, so-called, so the bars that go below zero uh, show either stable disease in blue with a little bit of tumor reduction or a partial response, which the yellow bars show. The overall response rate in, in this population, remember, they'd all stopped responding to Herceptin, but when you added in 17 AG, you got a restoration of 26% overall res response rate. This is a similar study done in non-small cell lung cancer, and, and you can see that those uh, patients whose tumors were positive for the kinase ALK were very sensitive, as well as tumors with KRAS mutations appear to be sensitive. Uh, and so, again, the ideal trial to do for this type of cancer would be to combine up front an HSP90 inhibitor and, for example, an ALK inhibitor. And there are many ALK inhibitors now on the market. Uh, there are a couple of these trials ongoing right now where the idea is to combine the HSP90 inhibitor at the beginning of the trial, not wait till the patient stops responding to for example, the kinase inhibitor. There, this is some anecdotal evidence in, of ganitespib, which is another HSP90 inhibitor. Uh, in ALK positive non small cell lung cancer, this is a patient with stage four uh, non small cell lung cancer, uh, progressed on crizotinib after one year. Crizotinib is an ALK inhibitor, and, and then treated with ganitespib as a single agent. And, and you can see uh, that after three doses of ganitespib, these tumors shrunk from this size to this size. So there definitely is evidence of clinical activity. Here's a BRAF, non-small cell lung cancer. B, BRAF is a, a driver in this case, and it's also a client of HSP90. This patient had progressed on a number of treatments, as you can read there. And ganitespib was then added as a monotherapy. And after four cycles, if you look, compare what's in the red circles, there's significant reduction in tumor size, which in this heavily pretreated patient lasted for more than, than a year, which is, which is quite significant. One more example, triple negative breast cancer. Uh, again, on, on uh, a lot of different treatments that didn't work, including some adriamycin and cytoxin and ataxane and radiation. And then uh, single-agent treatment uh, with ganitespib, 
And you also see shrinkage uh, of the tumor. So we're, we're hopeful that if we, can, if we can understand the right way to use these compounds, not really necessarily as an ultimately single agent, but in combination before the tumor has a chance to develop resistance, uh, we're, we're hopeful that we'll see more long-term efficacy. But one reason why efficacy has uh, been kind of hard to see in general is uh, because of this. And that's that HSP90 inhibitors, while they definitely show anti-tumor activity, also potentiate the activity of heat shock factor one, HSF1, which as I mentioned, uh, is the main driver of the heat shock response. So in response to proteotoxic stress, high temperature, et cetera, other insults, HSF1 gets activated and, and drives a, a number of molecular chaperones to increase in level, including HSP70, HSP27, and HSP90. And this is a protective response. So you don't want the tumor cell initiating this response. It's going to counteract the benefit of HSP90 inhibitors. And this is just uh, data taken from a clinical trial that was done here at NCI showing that there's a dose-dependent relationship in patients in, in their blood between the dose of HSP90 inhibitor they're getting and the level of HSP70 uh, in, in, in their blood. And, and this is a marker of induction of the heat shock response. And, and you can see in the bottom, basically, that there's really a very clear dose-dependent relationship between HSP70 and the, the dose in the patient of the HSP90 inhibitor. Uh, the correlation is amazingly good. So we don't want, we, we want to try to prevent the HSP90 inhibitor from inducing HSF1. Uh, as I mentioned, in cancer, HSF1 drives, in addition to its normal heat shock response, which is pro-survival, it drives a cancer-specific set of genes uh, that you really don't want to have activated uh, because they, they are going to help the survival and proliferation of cancer cells. So this is another reason to avoid HSF1 activation. The last well, so like I showed you with HSP90, if you, if you stratify sur survival of breast cancer patients by the level of HSF1 in their tumors, you can see that the more HSF1 is present, the worse the survival. This is highly significant. And if you look at TCGA uh, for tumors that generally overexpress HSF1, the tumor type is shown on the bottom. So a lot of different kinds of tumors, both solid and liquid. And uh, the green bars refer to CMYK. So CMYK is considered a bad thing to be overexpressed in tumors. And I'm just using that as an example. The red bars are HSF1. So CMYK may be highly expressed, but generally speaking in most tumors, HSF1 is even more highly expressed than C, than C, C mix. So you really must avoid its activation if at all possible. So we started looking at how HSP90 inhibition leads to, I won't say HSF1 activation, but potentiation of HSF1 activity. And I just want to show you a few slides about this. So this is a diagram of, of the uh, heat shock factor one uh, as a protein. And what's important to know is that it has to trimerize to get into the nucleus and bind to DNA. And what's uh, the, the trimerization domain is right here, this HRAB region. So under normal circumstances, when there's no stress, the HRC do domain uh, 
interacts with HRAB in monomers of HSF1 and prevents HRAB from being able to access and other monomers HRAB, and so this prevents the trimerization. And that's what keeps HSF1 quiet in unstressed cells. Of course, as I showed you in tumors, HSF1 is highly overexpressed, and it's very likely that some portion of it is active all the time, unlike in lymphocytes, for example, where it's probably not active unless you stress the cells. So we're not dealing with a situation where most of the HSF1 looks like this, it's more likely that a fair portion of it looks like this, which is the active form. So the dogma about HSP90 uh, and HSF1 is that it was thought to suppress HSF1 by keeping it as a monomer. And then uh, when misfolded proteins appear due to stress, HSP90 leaves HSF1 and goes to deal with uh, the prototoxic stress. There are a lot of things wrong with this hypothesis, but I just want to, sh to, to show in this cartoon, HSP90 inhibitors are, were thought to do the same thing. Their binding promotes dissociation of HSF1, which then leads to uh, the monomer being able to trimerize. So the idea was that HSP90 functions as a repressor of HSF1 and a sensor of proteotoxic stress, and that release from HSP90 is the key event in activating the heat shock response. But the model doesn't make any sense for a number of reasons. First of all, endogenous HSF1, HSP90 interaction is almost impossible to detect. You have to use chemical cross-linking to see it. Second of all, in vitro, in a paper that was just published a few months ago, HSP90 actually promotes dissociation of that HRC domain from HRAB, and it actually promotes the trimerization, not inhibits the trimerization. So we started looking for another explanation. And to do that, we wanted to see making use of a couple of HSP90 point mutants that represent different conformational states of the protein if we could detect HSP90 binding to HSF1 without having to go through the extreme lengths of cross-linking. So the two mutants shown here, E447A and HSP90 alpha and 42A and beta, uh, the two different isoforms of HSP90, uh, in the presence of ATP, uh, get stuck in a closed conformation because they can't hydrolyze ATP. So they're poised to hydrolyze ATP, but they can't. In contrast, the D93A, D888A mutants remain in the open conformation because they can't bind ATP in the first place. So we asked the question, if we transfect HA tagged HSF1 with flag tagged HSP90s, would any of these HSP90 proteins bind better than the others to HSF1 without any manipulation, just do a pull-down experiment? And in fact, the closed mutants, E47A for alpha, E42A for beta, did bind easily detectable HSF1. So this gave us a clue because the ATP-dependent HSP90 closed conformation is a very transient one. And in the case of human HSP90, it's infrequently sampled by the chaperone. So this makes it an unlikely suppressor of HSF1 in unstressed cells. The other thing that makes it unlikely that's what's happening is is the HSF1 dissociation from HSP90 a property of all stressors? So in the left set of plots here, we use three clinically evaluated HSP90 inhibitors. Uh, we've pulled down uh, HSP90 in the closed conformation with HSF1. Uh, after treating the cells or not with these inhibitors, and you can see that they all disrupt dissociation. 
compared to the control, which is that the second minus length. However, other stresses, including heat shock itself, shown on the right, or proteasome inhibition, shown next to heat shock, don't necessarily disrupt HSP90, HSF1 association. So disruption of 90 from HSF1 is not necessary to generate the heat shock response. So what's the deal with HSP90 inhibitors? What, why are they doing it and what does that mean? Well, we don't know yet why they're doing it, but we think we know the consequences. So we're looking at a, a reporter assay now using the heat shock uh, ele element region in the promoter of HSP70 uh, coupled to luciferase. And you can see here that 17 AAG uh, treatment for two hours does not uh, induce a significant heat shock response, which would be increased in luciferase activity. Heat shock for 30 minutes gives you a reasonable heat shock response, but if you put the two together, a two hour pretreatment with 17 AG, then a half hour heat shock, you get a markedly increased uh, heat shock response. So, how can this be? So, Basically, what's happening is, is that 17 AAG uh, as an HSP90 inhibitor is potentiating is the time that HSF1 is bound to its promoters on chromatin. Here we're looking at promoters of HSP70 in blue and in red HSP90. And we're doing the same type of experiment. So either drug pretreatment or not, and then followed by heat shock for 30 minutes. And then this is the time after heat shock shown in, uh, uh, in the bottom here in these axes. And this is a graphical representation of this chromatin IP data. So basically what you can see is that in the absence of 90 inhibitor, heat shock causes a very rapid within a few minutes, uh, binding of HSF1 to promoters on the DNA. But then by two hours, the binding has gone below the baseline, uh, which, is, which is set uh, to, to one here, below the baseline. But if you pretreat with the HSP90 inhibitor, you can see that the binding increases very quickly doesn't go any higher, but it increases quickly, but it stays bound significantly longer before it comes back to baseline. So HSF1 is on the DNA longer in the presence of the 90 inhibitor. And this is just shown in this reporter assay here. If you look at the uh, red line uh, versus the blue line, which is heat shock alone, this is 17 AG plus heat shock. So the reason we think this is the case is that the ATP-dependent conformation of HSP90, alpha in particular, which is sensitive to HSF1 as it happens, is used to pull HSF1 off of the chromatin and to turn off the heat shock response. So HSP90 inhibitors prevent that HSP90 from binding to HSF1 resulting in a prolongation of the heat shock response. And since there's some minimal level of uh, HSF1 bound to chromatin in tumor cells, addition of 17 AAG isn't necessarily inducing anything, but it's prolonging this occupancy and it's accumulating over time. So as part of these studies and in collaboration with Jason Guestwicki at the University of California, San Francisco, we stumbled upon the observation that an HSP70 inhibitor that he identified called JG98 is able to block uh, this response both to 17 AG and to heat shock. So if you look at the purple line here, we're pre-treating for two hours with both 17 AEG and JG98, the HSP70 inhibitor, and then giving heat shock. And you can see that we're completely blunting the heat shock response, which would normally be this red line. 
Uh, if you just want to look at heat shock alone and compare the blue line to the green line, you can see that on its own, JG98 is able to inhibit the heat shock response. So this suggests now a potential avenue to get around the property of HSP90 inhibitors uh, of inducing the heat shock response. What if we combine the, these two inhibitors? And this is just uh, chrom chromatin IP data showing that with heat alone and no drug, you get the typical rapid on, rapid off uh, response. In the presence of JG98, the on response that is very rapid is markedly suppressed compared to no drug. Uh, the, the off rate is similar uh, as it is with no drug in this case, but the initial binding is markedly reduced. And we think this is because JG98 is keeping HSF1 out of the nucleus. So uh, what we're looking at here are nuclear fractions and cytoplasmic fractions and blotting for HSF1. DMSO treated cells, a lot of HSF1 is in the cytoplasm relative to the nucleus. With HSP90 inhibitor, you flip that ratio. Uh, with JG98, it looks a lot like DMSO, but with ganatesbib and JG98, you're markedly reducing the amount of HSF1 in the nucleus. And in fact, it, this is resulting in an overall loss of the protein for, for HSF1 due to oligomerization in the cytosol. So looking at combining an HSP90 inhibitor with this HSP70 inhibitor at both the anti-client effect of HSP90 versus the HSP70 induction effect, you can see that here's ERB2, a very sensitive client, this is a dose response of galdanomycin. You can see at the lowest dose here, you're losing ERB2. But at the lowest dose, you're also inducing HSP70. JG98 is not affecting ERB2, but HSP70 is even less than in the control case here. So if you combine uh, a dose, a standard dose of JG98, albeit a relatively high dose in this experiment, you can see you have minimal effect on the anti-client activity of the HSP90 inhibitor, but you have a significant effect on the induction of HSP70 by the HSP90 inhibitor. So we are able to dissociate the anti-client activity from induction of the heat shock response, and this is exactly what we're looking for. And one, one more point I want to make is that it, this effect of JG98 is solely on the inducible form of HSP70, not on the constitutively expressed form known as HSC70. So there's always a lot of HSC70 in the cells. That's not touched by JG98. But the inducible form, and, and it's induced by an HSF1 transcriptional response is in fact uh, unique to HSP70 and it's uh, completely blocked by JG98. So we are pursuing still in preclinical models a combination of, of a 90 inhibitor and a 70 inhibitor and, and some other ideas to see if we can potentiate the anti-tumor activity of HSP90 inhibitors without increasing systemic toxicity. And this just summarizes what I've been saying. HSP90 inhibitors block dissociation of HSF1 from DNA and so increase translation in our model of HSP70, uh, whereas HSP70 inhibitors block nuclear entry of HSF1 and, and prevent that process from happening. So in the last couple of minutes, I just want to show you a way that you can use a post-translational modification of HSP90 to actually increase drug binding to the chaperone. And uh, what we're showing here is stimulation of HSP90. I'm just going to go through this quickly. This is published if you want to read about it. 
So Sumo is related to Ubiquitin, although it's a little larger. Uh, and it uh, is a modifier that is added to lysines in general or proteins that doesn't tag them for degradation like ubiquitin tends to, to do, but does other things. And it's reversible as ubiquitination is reversible. So we can get through this quickly. So one thing we noticed when we were looking at the impact of sumulation of the end domain of HSP90, where we've shown that there's only one lysine that's sumulated and it's conserved between yeast and human, is that this sensitizes both yeast and human cells to HSP90 inhibitors. And the way we showed that, uh, it's this, it's this uh, lysine in red shown here in the end domain, is we attached a a cleavable uh, group uh, between the endomain and the uh, yellow charged linker region in HSP90, which doesn't interfere with its chaperone activity, but allows you to cut the protein at that site and separate the endomain from the rest of the protein because there are other sumo sites scattered throughout HSP90, but there's only one sumo site in the endomain, and that's the one that we wanted to look at. So this way we can isolate the end domain. We can make a K to R mutation, which is non-sumulatable. And, and we can look at the degree of sumulation of, of that lysine as well. So just to show you quickly, uh, this is yeast now where SMT3 is the sumo equivalent in yeast. And you can see that you can attach SMT3 to wild type uh, end domain of HSP90, but if you if you mutate that lysine 178 to arginine, uh, you no longer can. So this is the unsumulated end domain. This is the sumulated end domain, and that's a mutant where you don't see a signal. You do the same thing in the human, where the residue is K191, and where we uh, found that it's sumo one not SUMO2 or 3, in, in humans there are three types of SUMO, but it's SUMO1 that's binding or modifying the lysine in HSP90. Uh, if you mutate that lysine to R, you don't see a signal. So in yeast, you can easily look at sensitivity to HSP90 inhibitor by doing this spot test of spotting limiting uh, reduced di dilutions of the yeast uh, on, these, on these plates and watching them grow. So where you don't see a white signal, you know the yeast are not growing and or they're dead. And you can see when that lysine is wild type and you express SMT3 uh, on a galactose promoter in yeast, they now become super sensitive to a series of HSP90 inhibitors compared to putting in empty plasmid instead of SMT3. However, if you make that K178 to R mutation and do the same experiment with all the sumulatable proteins and whatnot in the yeast, it doesn't matter if that one mutation of K178 to R makes them completely resistant to the HSP90 inhibitor. You can, you can uh, see a similar thing uh, if we look at a biotinylated HSP90 inhibitor and use it to uh, bind in a gel assay to yeast HSP90 in the presence and absence of SMT3. And you can see that in yeast that are expressing SMT3, when you run these lysates out on a gel, and, and put on the biotinylated ganatestib, you get much more binding where there is SMT3 compared to where you didn't express it. But when you make this K to R mutation of this one amino acid, there's no difference of overexpressing SMT3 or not. Uh, the same thing is true for human cells, but the point I wanna make here is, is that there seems to be an increase in sumulation of HSP90 alpha in these transformed NIH 3T3 cells compared to parental 3T3. So these are transformed with VSARC 
These are transformed with a met mutant that causes a form of kidney cancer. In both cases, there's more of the simulated form than in, in the parental cells. And this correlates with sensitivity to ganatespib if the readout is cleave PARP. So this is looking at apoptosis, basically, and cleave caspase as well. So compared to the parental cells and the two transformed cells. So the last cartoon next to the last slide is just to show you that we think what's happening when SUMO is, is put on one of the pronomers, and we know it's only put on one and, and not both of them, it predisposes binding of the HSP90 inhibitor. And this is likely to occur most frequently in HSP90 that is dynamically cycling because its chaperone activity is in high demand such as in cancer cells or other stress cells. And so this paper, which came out many years ago now, uh, which reported a high affinity confirmation of HSP90 in tumor cells that conferred the selectivity of HSP90 inhibitors to tumors, which to this day is true for all N-terminal HSP90 inhibitors, but no one really has an explanation for why it's true. And we think, that it's likely because in these tumors, HSP90 is actively cycling through these conformations, and uh, the real target of the HSP90 inhibitors uh, is, is uh, to, to bind to one of these uh, ATP competitive conformational states. And that's it. Um, thanks for staying awake for the hour. <laughs> And there's a few minutes if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them.